Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dujin Huang. I'm an architect uh, working and living in Seoul. Uh, it's very nice to meet you all this afternoon. And actually, uh, my talk today had to compete with the beautiful weather outside. Uh, I have, I have so many of you with me online right now, so I'm very proud. And thank you for attending my talk. Uh, the, title the title of my, of my talk, talk this afternoon is Korean Architecture and Spatial, and spatial Flexibility. Uh, it's about an inspiration, an inspiration that we can, that we can get, get from, traditional from traditional Korean, Korean architecture. architecture. I, hope I hope you will enjoy my talk. My talk. Uh, would you please, please turn on the, uh, the PowerPoint? Thank you. The comments around the picture in the middle, uh, what I very frequently heard from the professors who are visiting architects when I was an architecture student back in early 1980s in Korea. Uh, spread your arms to touch both walls. It's about the human scale with traditional Korean houses, which we call Hano, as you probably know. Uh, being young and quite cocky and anti-establishment, just like any other student, uh, I didn't really fully accept this comment because I thought, well, if you build a small house in concrete, you can still spread your arms to touch both walls. It's not specifically about home. Other comments such as put a desk and any room will become a study or for a table, table, and, and it will, will become, become a dining room. A, a bed will turn any room into a bedroom. bedroom. You, can you can use it as a tea room, room as well. So all, all these, these comments, comments about how Hanok changes, changes its function, function which, which we architects, we architects uh, sometimes, sometimes call programs, programs all the time. All the time. But again, again, I was, I was very, very skeptical, skeptical about these comments, comments as well, as well because, because I mean, it's, it's not, not really about Hanok itself, it's about, about something else. else. And I kind, I kind of wondered, wondered why, why all these professors, professors and visiting architects architect has to say things, things like this, because, because at the time, time I thought these were just full of, of uh, uh, what, we what we normally call these days, kukpong which we can, which we can translate, translate it as, as national, national pride or national, national over pride. pride. And, and as, as I became, became a professional, professional architect, architect, architect and, and uh, started, uh, started to, to gain more experience, experience in actual, actual design, design and construction, and construction of real buildings, buildings. I, look I look back, back at, at these comments, comments again, again and uh, try very hard to understand why these comments had to be made when I was a student. And then slowly, little by little, I started to understand what was important was not probably just the architecture itself, but the way we use it, especially in regard to furniture and equipment. Look at, Look at these pictures, pictures and you can tell uh, much, much of traditional, traditional furniture, furniture that, that our ancestors, the old time Koreans, used, used were actually quite small. small. Look, at Look at the dining, dining table, table which, we can, which we call Soban. It's actually, so actually for, for just, just one person. person. And, and you don't, don't really, really go, go to, to a dining, dining room, room for a meal. A meal. You just, you just stay, stay in your, your own room, room. and somebody, somebody, either your mother or a housemaid, housemaid or a servant, or a servant will take it to your room. room. So it's very it's small, small and mobile. mobile. Look, at Look at the picture, picture of the ring, ring on, the right. on the right. It's again it's very small. small. So, so all this furniture and equipment, again, again including, including the dress, dress hanger at the bottom left, left and, and traditional, traditional folding, folding screen, screen. And, and also traditional, traditional bedding, bedding. In, the in the picture on the far, far right. right. 
All these furniture and equipments are really quite mobile because they are lightweight, very flexible, and space saving. So probably because of these extremely mobile and lightweight and small furniture and equipments, it was possible for Korean Hanoks to have very high level of spatial flexibility. That's what I have noticed and uh, recognized. The architecture itself also had to cooperate in this game of attaining high level of flexibility in a living environment. Uh, look at these two pictures. Uh, these are actually uh, one of our past projects uh, called Ejihan. It's in Sochon, the area to the west of Gyeongbok Palace. I'm sure you probably know about this area quite well. Uh, many years ago, about seven or eight years ago, a very young couple, man and woman, uh, they visited our office. Uh, you can see them in the middle of the picture on, uh, on the top and they were engaged. So they were about to be married soon. And in preparation for the wedding, they bought a very old and very dilapidated, almost abandoned hanok in the alley area in Sachon. And they asked us to renovate this house into their, uh, uh, the, into their home which we did, and the picture on the bottom left, the bottom right, is the finished uh, house. Uh, what you can notice here uh, in the picture in the bottom right is the presence of big hanging doors above the, uh, uh, in front of the main uh, living room area of Hano. Uh, these, uh, these hanging doors, which we call sabunamun in, uh, in Korean, uh, it can also be translated as flying doors. That's normally the term that I use because I love it. I love the, the, uh, the feeling of the word. So these flying doors are really about the way we use the space in a very flexible way. During the winter, you can close it, you can lower it, and you can unfold it, and it becomes four leaf doors. And then during the summer, or when the weather is really nice, like today, you can fold it and lift them up, just like this. So architecture also had its role in creating a living environment that is highly flexible, as you can tell. So this is another example of flying doors. Uh, this is at a six-star hotel called Seamark, which is in Gangneung, city of Gangneung, to, uh, on the east coast of Korean Peninsula. Uh, this uh, very luxury hotel has a Hanok annex. And the main building was designed by an American architect named Richard Meyer. He is a global uh, superstar architect. And our office was commissioned to design the Hanok Annex for the hotel. And this is the picture of that part of the hotel, which we call Ho Anje. And again, in this picture, you can see the presence of two flying doors. This time, the doors are in, inside the house, not outside. So by using this kind of doors, we can control the way we use spaces depending on different circumstances. So all these things add up to the, uh, the net effect of creating and living in an environment that's, that really caters to our changing needs. Back in traditional times, sometimes uh, our ancestors, the old Koreans, uh, really uh, went very far uh, and they designed such a very elaborate system of doors and windows. And uh, you see one of the examples here. And uh, this is a combination of sliding doors and swing doors. And 
I took this picture at a very famous traditional uh, residence called Myeongjegotep, which is in Nonsan in Chungcheongnam-do. Uh, we call this uh, Angojigi Moon in, uh, in Korean language, but uh, uh, probably in English, I would say the best way to put it is sliding, sliding and swing door. The way it works is actually quite interesting. Uh, the two leaves in the middle, they slide open and, and slide close, but two leaves on the outside, they're swing doors. So when you uh, want to completely uh, open all the doors, all leaves, what you can do is you slide the middle leaves to both sides, and not just the doors, but also the door frames, they swing open. So you can, you can, this way you can connect two adjoining rooms as if they are one single connected space. So what we can say from uh, these pictures is that mobility of furniture and equipment, when it is combined with architectural changeability, together they uh, work together to create, to achieve a very uh, high level of spatial flexibility. And this is the main theme of my talk today. Uh, the net result of uh, living in such a, living in, uh, in this kind of living environment with a very high level of spatial flexibility is that even a very small house can accommodate surprisingly large number of people. Uh, this is a very small hanok in Bukcheon. Bukcheon, probably you, uh, many of you already know the area or already visited the area. It's one of the best tourist spots in the entire country. And the name of this house is Sangyeje. And it's only 49 square meters big. So it's a very small house. But before uh, we also renovated this house. This is one of our projects, uh, which we did about 15 years ago. And the owner was a young lady, and she told us a very interesting story. When she first visited this house in order to start the negotiation to buy it, she noticed that three generations of family members were living inside this very small house. So this is what spatial flexibility can do for you uh, because of uh, the, the very versatile way of using spaces depending on different situations. Uh, this kind of small house can accommodate surprisingly a large number of people. We will look at uh, a different aspect of architecture from now. Uh, more generic, more global uh, aspect of architecture, not just a Korean traditional architecture. But you're creating a picture of probably the most famous and most influential uh, residential architecture of 20th century. This is Villa Savoie, uh, designed by the famous Swiss French architect called Le Corbusier. This was built in 1929. Uh, 10 years after the Spanish flu, uh, Le Corbusier was uh, very obsessed with hygiene. So I don't have the slide here today, but uh, in the middle of the entrance lobby of this house, he placed uh, a toilet sink. The idea is when you immediately after you enter your house, you wash your hands. And he did this because uh, they learned a lot during the, the Spanish flu pandemic. I mean, just as we all learn a lot from the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So that's one of the very interesting features of this house. But the reason why I'm showing you this picture is this particular house really represent a very big trend in contemporary architecture, which we call functionalism. We are still living under the influence of this very influential and important uh, architectural theory. But in retrospect, from the vintage, po vintage point of 21st century, 
the way Le Corbusier approached and formulated this uh, theory was somewhat outdated from our uh, contemporary point of view. Because when he pub first published his idea about functionalist architecture, he wrote a book called Verwing Architecture, uh, which, in, uh, which is in French and it means toward an architecture. And he, he compared the contemporary automobile design of at the time to classical Greek temple architecture. And his point was that if you study very carefully about the way engineers design automobiles and airplanes at that time, we can probably uh, create something very classical in spirit, which is comparable to this classical architecture from the Greek period. But if you look at these two pictures of the automobiles in the bottom, uh, you, you can tell they are really old fashioned. So from historical perspective, this very um, idea of functionalist architecture, it took place at the dawn of machine age. And at the time, the machines were very bulky, it was big, and they really needed very strong formal language. But now, in the 21st century, when we say contemporary high technology, we normally refer to the, the objects or uh, the way things work, uh, which were often very immaterial. You can hardly see them. I mean, I mean for example, take a look at a Wi-Fi machine. They're so small these days. They are actually smaller than your hand, but it allows you to be connected to the rest of the world through internet. So the high technology of these days, they are not really, they don't really need formal language to, to use them or to design around them. And they're so lightweight and they're so small and they hardly occupy any space at all. So what that means is that even though we still continue to live in the functionalist uh, world, the way you approach it these days could be a little different from the time Le Corbusier worked as an architect. So uh, I came up with an idea of rewriting global architectural history. It's my personal version. Uh, you don't get to see this in any other books. This is uh, very original or uh, my own uh, uh, the, uh, invention, so to speak. Uh, if I write a, a book on history of global architecture, uh, I would use the framework of the relationship between buildings and machines. Uh, and uh, the key word I like to, I love to use is plumbing because plumbing actually is wiring and piping, but they represent how machines uh, interact with buildings. For example, the majority of global architectural history and many buildings uh, belongs to what I call pre-plumbing area. And all those beautiful Gothic cathedrals, Renaissance and Baroque buildings, and Greek and Roman buildings, they all belong to this category. They are pre-modern, and these buildings were built and uh, designed and built before the advent of the machine age. So, so uh, in other words, they didn't have any kind of relationship with any kind of machine. So if you go to Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, for example, now the building is equipped with contemporary technology, but it was the result of the number of renovations that took place after 19th century. But during the 13th century or 14th century, immediately after the building was built, didn't have any air conditioning, probably had very minimal means of heating, no communication equipment whatsoever, no internet, of course. So in other words, these buildings that belong to this pre-plumbing era, they're just about space and structure. But the whole thing started to change sometime around 19th century and early 20th century, because 
architecture started to be integrated with the machine age. And this is the era that I call pro-plumbing because he loves plumbing, he loves machine. He want to be incorporated with machines. And we are still living in that uh, historical era, in my, in my opinion. So this refers to modern and contemporary architecture in general. It's about combination of architecture machine. And it's about the way buildings use energy and it's about the way buildings are connected to infrastructure of our society, such as you know, underground tunnels, uh, sewage system, uh, electric system, all kinds of things. So, I mean, this really belongs to the functionalist uh, architecture, which Le Corbusier uh, you know, wrote about in his book. But in the 21st century, uh, where we are now, the whole thing started to change again because we are seeing more and more cases in which architecture is integrated with latest high technology that are often invisible, immaterial, very small, doesn't really occupy a lot of spaces around them, as I mentioned before. So I would say this post-plumbing era architecture really is the architecture of the future. And many buildings these days, they generate their own energy using solar panels and uh, geothermal uh, the, uh, energy generation and all that. And it's getting highly integrated with information system as well. So this really is post-functionalism uh, architecture. And it is a, uh, the uh, result of the advanced machine age, the time that we live in right now. So with this kind of historical perspective in our minds, when we look back on the early 21st century Hano Renaissance, which is still taking place, uh, there are a few things that we can say about it. Uh, in retrospect, I remember it was about 2000, uh, that's the year that I started my practice. And at first, I didn't have any intention to work on Hanok projects. I considered myself as a typical contemporary architect. And I still do that. And Hanok practice has become a very special part of what I do as an architect. But in retrospect, uh, sometime around 2000, uh, more and more people started to be interested in traditional houses. And people actually bought them and renovate them and started to live in them. And for someone like me who grew up in 1970s and 80s as a young student, the whole thing came to me as a shock. Because as a student, we learned that it's a good thing to study about Hanok and to get inspirations from Hanok, but never uh, think about Hanok as an actual uh, the architectural practice because it's a things of the past. That's exactly what we learned at school. But as I just said, around the turn of the millennia, people suddenly started to be interested in uh, traditional Korean architecture. And I became part of the change. And from the historical perspective, which I just uh, explained, we can say that Hanok is a very typical pre-plumbing typology. The majority, the very concept of Hanok was invented and practiced well before the advent of machine age because Hanok has been uh, formulated for such a long time before the modernization period. So essentially it was a very uh, pre-modern, pre-plumbing prototype, but all of a sudden around the turn of the millennia, it started to be evolved to incorporate all these elements of not just pro-plumbing architecture, but post-plumbing architecture as well. As you can see in this picture, very interesting picture. Again, this is Ejihan, the same house that you saw 
in the previous pictures. And the, the couple on the right, they are actual owners. They kind of volunteer to be in the pictures <laughs> and very, um, very nice people. And this is the way they use their Hano. This was totally unthinkable, even early 1990s, uh, because uh, the, the concept of watching movie using video projector at your home, I think it started to come to us sometime around 2004, 2005. So this is a very new thing. But you can actually do this. You can actually turn your Hanok into a movie theater because video projects, projectors are normally quite small. You can, all you need to do, you, you just hook it up to your laptop and there you go, voila, you have a movie theater. So the whole uh, mission of Hanok Renaissance can be uh, turned into a single uh, mission statement how to accommodate contemporary lifestyle in an essentially pre-modern prototype. And this is exactly what I have been doing and what I have been trying to, to contribute to. The picture on the left shows the hard reality of modern a contemporary Hanok renovation. On the outside, it gives you a very nice look and feel, very old traditional look and feel. But once you open the closet door, it's filled with machines, Wi-Fi machines, home security machines, of course, uh, air conditioning and the heating and cooling kind of thing. But they're so nicely integrated. So from the outside, you don't really feel the presence of all these machines, but they're there because without them, you cannot have contemporary lifestyle in this old pre plumbing pre-modern typology. We're living in a very interesting time in history because uh, we are witnessing uh, many social changes that are very closely related to uh, the, the changes and development, development in, in, uh, in contemporary technology such as this. Uh, these are a few examples of what I call hybrid spaces. Uh, picture on, on the top left, it's a small cafe in a bank building, in a building called Capital One, I think it's somewhere in the United States. Uh, we call this type a shopping shop typology. It's a, it's a shop within a bigger shop. So cafe in a bank, which is very commonplace these days. And the picture on, in the middle and on the right, uh, on the left, uh, it's, uh, it's a home office. On the right is an office cafe. An interesting thing these days is homes are more and more becoming like offices and offices are more and more like cafe, uh, the, the homes because many offices now have kitchens and cafeterias just like homes and many homes are now becoming a place where you not only just live, but work, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. And picture on the bottom left is a library hotel in, in Tokyo. It's a place called Book and Bed, B&B. Uh, it's probably a parody of Airbnb, bed and breakfast, but it's a, it's a book and bed. And coffees, I mean, a lot of people choose to work in in cafes instead of offices. And uh, so we call these places coffees. coffees. So all these hybrid uh, spaces, again, shows the way people use spaces in a very flexible way. So it has a lot, many common things with the way we used to use our Hanoks in the old days. Well, I'm not saying the entire world owes Korea for having this kind of highly flexible uh, way of living. I'm just saying that uh, we can find the same thing, the same thing in our traditional Korean architecture. But I think things always 
uh, happen to come back in history. So what happens in the old days will happen again in the future. So the spatial, uh, the flexible way of using spaces is now again with us, big time. Uh, so a few years ago, this kind of uh, a place was very common, especially in the Gangnam area in Seoul. During the daytime, the place is an automobile service center, as you can see in the picture on the left. But after the dawn, the service center is closed and the whole place suddenly turns itself into a restaurant, outdoor restaurant, as you can see on the picture on the right. How is this possible? I think uh, looking at this kind of uh, instant business conversion, somebody at Korean tax service is probably not quite happy. I don't know how they uh, process the tax issues in a business like this. What kind of place is this from a tax, pay, uh, tax collector's point of view? Is this a car service center or a restaurant? But from architectural point of view, which I have been um, talking about, this kind of thing can take place. This kind of thing can be possible, not just because of the architecture of the place itself, but again, because of the furniture that they use. Look at those furniture. They all, the chairs are all stackable. And in this kind of restaurant, they serve you know, the Korean barbecue and Korean beef stew and things like that. But they don't have wiring and they don't have plumbing. What they have is what we call brusta. It's a mobile uh, gas stove. So what I try to tell you is that with this kind of highly flexible and mobile and lightweight furniture and equipment, you can instantly change one place to another in a very easy and comfortable way. Again, thanks to the, uh, the contemporary technology. I mean, we, take, we, we, we tend to take all these things very uh, as granted because you are so familiar with them. But from a bigger historical point of view, these are all the result of highly efficient development in technologies. Smart, isn't it? I say smart because this way you can use one physical place for two different purposes, depending on different time of the day. And it's about the efficiency. It's about the way we use our cities, the way we design our cities. Normally, many places in the cities that we live in, they are designed and built for just one single purpose. So offices are normally empty during the evening and during the night. Of course, we Koreans tend to work long hours. That's an exception, but homes are normally empty during the daytime. But if you combine them, then you can probably come up with a much uh, more efficient way of using physical spaces than we do now. So again, we can learn uh, great lessons and ins inspirations from the way we build and design and live in traditional Hanoks. That's the point of my lecture today. But as I said, uh, we Koreans were not the only ones to do this. I mean, of course, there are many, many examples of people trying to come up with an idea of designing uh, buildings that can be used for different uh, uh, programs and functions. Uh, for example, this is a very famous icon of uh, modern architecture designed by German architect uh, named Miss Van der Rohe. This is in Chicago uh, as a part of the Illinois Institute of Technology campus. Uh, this crown hall, the name of the building is crown hall. And this was uh, the building that houses uh, departmental architecture of that academic institution. Uh, Ms. Van der Rohe was very interested in creating a space that can be used for different purposes, just like what I'm talking about today. 
and he applied the same concept into this uh, small house. And again, in, uh, in, I think it's in, uh, in Illinois as well. It's called Farnsworth House after the name of the owner. Uh, he, he used the term uh, universal space for this kind of design. But his ideas didn't really work quite well because looking at, uh, look at the plan of the crown, house, crown hall, didn't really have any partitions at all. One part of the building is the lecture hall. The other part is a design studio. But when you give a lecture, just like what I do now, you, 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 you create noise, you create sound. But when you work in a design studio, you want to work in a quiet and comfortable uh, space. And these things, they started to fight against each other. So as a result of that, this beautiful architectural concept of universal space didn't really work quite well in, in the practical way. But if we use this building these days, the whole thing can be worked out. Because now we can use this kind of high technology gadgets directional speakers that allows you to send your voices in just one direction. So you, you happen to be in the other part of the space, you don't hear it. And lecturers, they can wear a wireless microphone and headset, so they can speak very softly. They don't need to raise their voices either. So all these high-tech, small mobile gadgets, when they are combined with buildings designed and built on the base of universal space or flexible space, they can do a miracle. A single building can turn it into many different things. Again, it's about the conservation of energy, conservation of building materials, conservation of time because you don't have to move around that much. And these are the things that, been, that I'm very interested in these days. So sometimes building can be turned into something quite different, such as these two. All the Christian churches have turned into libraries and nightclubs all over the world. Uh, so with that uh, kind of uh, framework, frame of ideas uh, in our mind, uh, we, I will show you some, a few of my projects that I do at work. Uh, Many of them are related to the topic of today's uh, talk, but some just stands on their own. But I decided to show them uh, because I wanted to understand what kind of uh, architectural projects that we, uh, people in our office uh, have been uh, produce, producing for the last 20 years. Uh, my office is called Dujin Wan Architects. It's again named after my name. Uh, you saw this uh, house already. This is Ejihan, the highly flexible hanok that can be turned into a movie theater. Such a small hanok, so we were interest, interested in creating multiple level of, of floors. For example, here, underneath this uh, sitting area, uh, these are all storage. storage. And uh, above the kitchen, we have an attic and uh, we turned it into a small library. So we turn, uh, we use a single physical space for three different functions. And so this is again a different way of achieving high level of flexibility in a, in a building. Uh, this is a different Hanok, uh, which we designed in Umpyeong Hanok Maul uh, in the suburbs of uh, the great, great uh, city of Seoul. Uh, this is a two-story Hano, which is actually quite new. Uh, and the building lot, the property is not really rectangular. It's, uh, it's an odd-shaped uh, piece of land. But again, it helped us to create a very uh, uh, the unique uh, house. Uh, this is another building, it's a contemporary design, uh, which uh, literally faces the entrance of the Changdok Palace. It's called Nose Terrace. It's in Waryongdong. And the building is owned by uh, actually one of my friends and his wife. 
the way we design the building the, uh, is based on this uh, idea of spatial flexibility. Uh, one part of the wall can be completely open and closed. So when you uh, op completely open the wall, you have this beautiful uh, panoramic view of the Changdok Palace. But when if you close it, then 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 you get a very different uh, interior view of the house. And even from the kitchen, you can see the main uh, main bu entrance building of the Changdok Palace. And uh, I show this building to you already, this, uh, this Simak Hotel, uh, Hoanje, Hanok Annex of the six star luxury hotel. The building in the middle is the main building designed by American architect, Richard Meyer. And the building, the full foreground is my own creation. And again, uh, for this building, we, uh, we incorporate, we installed a large number of flying doors because we thought this part of the, uh, the hotel can not only use for regular guests, but also can be used as a banquet and function space for weddings or parties or things like that. So on a beautiful day like this, all those doors can be folded and raised so that you have this nice transition between interior and exterior of this part of the hotel. A uh, picture on the left shows, actually we did as an architectural joke. Uh, what we did was uh, we, we scanned uh, a few paintings by a very famous Korean traditional uh, painter. And uh, we kind of collage, we made a collage using those images to create a, a perspective of this hotel but the owner really loved it. So we sometimes we, we continue to do that. And this is a, a open floor with organ with uh, flying doors. And this is a very actually contemporary style uh, bathroom in the, inside the hotel. And this particular building uh, it's called Castle of Skywalkers, which is in Chonan. Uh, this is a training facility for a professional volleyball uh, team. And I'd like to show you a video, a YouTube video clip of it. Please.
about uh, this afternoon, the building also has a very high level of special flexibility because it's a uh, very interesting set of doors and windows. For example, this large wall here, glass wall, it can be fully open. You can see it uh, later in this video. The reason for that. small house that we designed in uh, Jeju Island. Uh, we have a video, but because of time limit, I'm, I'm not going to show it. Uh, but again, this house is also based on the concept of having a very flexible envelope. So the, the doors can be completely open. And I mean, luckily, we have mosquito net. So the interior and ex exterior of the house can be very beautifully uh, integrated. Uh, it's a different hanok that we designed in the outskirts of Seoul called Villa H because the owner's last name is Huang, just like mine. So we decided to call this Villa H. It's, all, it's all also about me, I think. <laughs> uh, this is our latest project in Jeju Island as well. It's actually huge the residential and uh, the representational hanok inside uh, the uh, a tourist uh, park. Okay. Also, this uh, Hanok has a large number of uh, flying doors as well. So probably uh, today, if the weather in Jeju Island is the same as weather in, uh, in Seoul, probably all these doors are open, allowing the air to freely come in and they can enjoy the view outside from inside the house. <laughs> All right, uh, my mission as an architect 
is to somehow build a bridge between our tradition and and the contemporary world that we live in. So every single building with, that we design, I hope that it becomes a living space accommodating various programs, often helped by the some of the ideas that we can learn from the traditional Korean architecture. Thank you. All right, we are about four minutes uh, late, but uh, we'll start Q&A session. If you have a question, uh, you can use that raise your hand uh, button in your, I guess this is Zoom, right? Okay, uh, one student has asked me uh, what kind of material that we used for the volleyball training center. I simply called it aluminum cladding, but more specifically, uh, the material is called aluminum expanded metal. The reason for that is uh, they start with a large sheet of aluminum and they make cuts all across it in a very geometrical pattern. And then they uh, pull both ends using uh, the heavy machines. Then all these slots on the sheet of uh, aluminum becomes an opening and they become like what you saw on the screen. So the material is aluminum and the name of the product is called aluminum expanded metal. And normally it was a material meant to be used for civil engineering, for roadworks and things like that. But uh, when I first saw the material about 15 years ago, at a, about 10 years ago at a Shanghai Expo, I thought, gee, it's such a cool material. Maybe I can use it for buildings as well. And then later I noticed that other architects had the same idea. So it's not just... Uh, me, but uh, there are many other architects who use that material as a very nice cladding for the exterior wall of their project. Any other questions? Uh, say it again. Okay, good question. Uh, there are a few ways. Uh, you can start with raw untreated wood, but also you can uh, pre-treat it such as, uh, you can use chemical uh, preservatives. You can soak the entire wood in a pool of chemicals so that the chemical can be soaked into the tissue of the wood. That's one way of doing it. Another way is you burn the surface of it. You just smoke it, smoke the wood. It's a very time-honored way of preserving the wood. Has been done in many different corners of the world, in Europe, in Japan. So that's one, another way of doing it. And the third option is after you finish the building, you apply a coat of stain. So there are many ways of doing it. Next question, please. <laughs> uh, well, actually, a lot of people in my own field in Korea are now asking, if not the same question, but a similar question, uh, are there a future for architects here in Korea? <laughs> because we, we have already passed the time in our contemporary history in which we build really built really hectic, 
uh, in a hectic way. But I think uh, the overall quality of building is getting higher and higher in Korea. So I think there, there are futures for architects. As for young architects trying to get a job in the architect's offices, I, I like to uh, be a little encouraging. I mean, the, uh, many offices are still hiring. So if you are concerned about it, just, just give it a try. <laughs> Trends. Okay, again, I, as I said, uh, even in my office, which is not quite big, we have all, uh, about 10 people. So we are a mid-sized company. Uh, these days we work, uh, we try very uh, hard to create a building that can have a, that can accommodate uh, very different uh, programs or functions based on the time of the day. And I call this kind of building um, a rainbow cake building because rainbow cake, you have all different colors of layers. So normally many buildings have just one function. Offices are just uh, offices from bottom to the top. Apartments are just apartment from bottom to the top. But in our office, we are trying to create buildings that have much more complex uh, combination of different functions. Again, uh, this is about the belief that I have as an architect to create a building which caters to the ever-changing needs of the society in a much more efficient and energy and material saving way. So it, again, it has a lot to do with what I discussed today. It's a good question to think of. I don't know, but I thought about it actually. Uh, we, I think generally speaking, we, in our culture, the use of monochromatic palette has been with us for such a long time. For example, again, if you look at Hanok, all you get to see just three colors, color of the wood, color of the white wall and color of dark gray uh, clay tiles. But the common things among these three materials, they are the true color of the material. They are not coated. They are not layered colored, just like you know, paint job. So because of this very simple color palette, which has been with us for a very long time, I think use of very loud and uh, the uh, exuberant color palette is we're not simply quite used to that. But again, things are changing uh, rapidly. And the another aspect of it is uh, it really depends on how you look at the buildings. Many people tend to believe that buildings are on objects which should stand out. But in a bigger perspective, in a urban uh, situation, many buildings are seen as, as a collection. So they become background for other things. For example, people, or cars. And so that's one of the reasons why, not just in Korea, but also in many parts of the world, many buildings are surprisingly monochromatic. And these kind of monochromatic buildings can work very nicely as background buildings. So they are not necessarily a bad things. Okay. That's the kind of future of cities that I'm imagining these days. Because uh, if you live in Seoul or any other cities in Korea, or for that matter, any other cities in the world, what is normally taken for granted is you go to your work, you commute to your work twice a day, and you, and 
you come back home. So you make two journeys every day. And depending on how much time you spend for the journey and how much distance you have to cover between your work and home, your quality of your life can change dramatically. My rule of thumb for the ideal commute time, I think maximum is 30 minutes. If you commute more than 30 minutes one way, then you are ruining your life. You're spending way too much time just going to, from one place to another, and you have to do it again after work. A little time, like an hour, accumulated over a long period of time can become a big thing. So if you want to live a happy life, do your best to make your commute time short so that you can use the time saved for other things. But if you live in Korea, to have that kind of lifestyle is very difficult because many majority of buildings in Korea are built for just one purpose. So that's why we had to commit a very long distance. Uh, Korea, uh, unfortunately, has the, uh, uh, the record of longest commute time in, among OECD countries. It's about 1.5 hours every day. So that's why Koreans are tired all the time. So as an architect, I like to contribute to the overall society's effort to create a city where people don't need to move them much during their everyday life. Over the weekend, you can go to, you can visit a faraway place, that's fine. But everyday life, your travel distance should be kept to a minimum. But it's very difficult to maintain that kind of lifestyle in Korea because of all these hardwares we already have. So that's why I try very hard to come up with an idea of buildings with very flexible way of using spaces. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up. And thank you for listening. And uh, I think the sun is still up. So go out. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.